like everywhere we look, from billboards to magazine covers, we're surrounded by images and themes seeking to turn us from Christ. How do we keep ourselves from sin when we're facing such constant enticement? Well, today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg describes the biblical response to sexual temptation. Alistair is teaching from Genesis chapter 39. We're dealing this morning with this whole matter of temptation. Temptation is an enticement to evil or to sin. Temptation in and of itself is something that is known to everyone, known even to the Lord Jesus himself. And temptation in and of itself is not sin. It is our response to temptation which leads us either in the paths of righteousness or down into the meadows of our disobedience. And this morning, as we look again at the life of Joseph, we have probably the classic illustration in the whole of the Old Testament as to how to deal particularly with the matter of temptation as it expresses itself in this issue of morality and interpersonal relationships, and particularly the whole issue of sexuality. Now, I have four points before me in my outline this morning, and I want to work through them with you. The first is almost a passing issue, but I do want simply to address it. First of all, I'd like you to notice how verse 6 concludes with one sentence, Now, Joseph was well-built and handsome. Notice, first of all, would you, the peculiar challenges of beauty and charm. Joseph was always someone's favorite. Even in the few years that have elapsed, in the few chapters we've considered, we found that he was the favorite of his father. Then we discover him in this section to be the favorite of Potiphar. And now, all of a sudden, he's become the favorite of Potiphar's wife. What is it that makes an individual that kind of person? Well, there are many factors that contribute to it, it would seem. But on a superficial level, one of those is just physical characteristics. And in the context of Egypt, it was apparently no different from the context of Cleveland. There was a special door of opportunity which swung open for the beautiful people. And Joseph was a beautiful person. That's what it says. He was well-built and he was handsome. And that is something which many of us would love to uh, be able to uh, enjoy and would love to be able uh, to experience. And there is a peculiar challenge that is wrapped up in being the possessor of beauty or in being the observer of beauty. 18th century Scottish commentator puts it like this, "'Dost thou want beauty? Be content and thankful.'" that you are free from the snares which often attend it. The peculiar challenges of beauty and charm. Secondly, I want us to notice the particular elements in this strong temptation. The peculiar challenges of beauty and charm is almost in passing. Now we get to the heart of the matter. Look at the particular elements in this strong temptation. I have four of them to mention to you. Number one, or A, depending on how you like to do it, the approach was subtle. Oh, no, says somebody, if you look at the text, it would appear that the approach was startling. Well, it was startling, but that's essentially the second point. Let's do the first one before we get to the second one. Notice the phrase in verse 7, after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph. Now, what does that mean? She said, oh, there's Joseph. And oh, oh, there's Joseph again. No, the King James Version does his justice. This is what it says in the King James Version. After a while, she cast her eyes upon Joseph. There came a point someday, however soon in the event, when she began to notice Joseph in a different way. Initially, uh, Potiphar got a new slave. Initially, there was another fellow in the midst of all the slaves in the house. But suddenly, one day along the journey, she looked at him, 
And then she looked back the second time, and now she started to cast her eyes upon Joseph. When a girl starts to cast her eyes upon a guy, the guy knows. Incidentally, it works both ways, but the story is about a lady and a guy, so I'm just sticking with the text, okay? The same is true when a man shakes your hand and holds your gaze for that subtle split second longer than is just normal in a greeting. And she cast her eyes upon Joseph. She began in her mind to look at him differently, in a way that does not become someone who wants to walk the straight and narrow, wants to live in purity, wants to maintain the family bed in order. Loved ones, this morning, let us notice and notice clearly that the eyes are the gateway into our souls, that the eyes are the path through which many affections come. And the subtlety of her beginning is directly related to what she did with her eyes. We used to sing in Scotland, maybe you did here, Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Because your father's up above and he's looking down in love, so be careful, little eyes, what you see. Subtle. Secondly, the approach was striking. It was as striking as it was subtle. Her eyes ensnared her heart. And as a result of that, she completely lost any notion of modesty at all. Did this woman have no shame? Could she proceed to such a bare-faced invitation to adultery? How could it ever happen? How is it that it does happen? Where do such propositions emerge from? The answer is that in Potiphar's wife, she was clearly feeding lust at the level of her imagination. And when we feed lust at the level of our imagination or feed desire at the level of our imagination, we take forward the possibility that we may actually suddenly do what we've been thinking about. For example, you imagine yourself behind the wheel of a certain kind of automobile and the advertisements come across with such appeal. You see yourself, rather than the actor, driving off into the sunset. You see yourself coming round the curve, making that big turn, and you've already got yourself in your mind's eye behind the wheel. And suddenly, you're behind the wheel. And suddenly, you're behind in your payments. (laughs) And suddenly, you're absolutely behind. Now, where did it all start? It all started here in your imaginations. That's what was happening here with this lady. First, she's subtle as she casts her eyes. Then she's striking as she makes her approach. Because when lust is fed at the level of imagination, it is always ready to break forth in an instant, driven by almost blind and furious and almost irrepressible urges. Because we've already gone down the road so far that all we need is the occasion, and once the occasion arises, we're there. And that, you see, was what had happened to this lady. So the approach was subtle. Secondly, the approach was striking. Thirdly, the approach was sustained. It was sustained. It would appear from verse 8 and 9 that Joseph's refusal only served to make him more desirable. And as we see in verse 10, she bugged Joseph day after day. Now, what did she say to him when she came along? I don't know. But I can imagine, because she had expressed herself very clearly. 
Joseph was in no doubt as to the proposition. The subtlety of her eyes had given way to the stridency of her approach, and now she gets him day after day. She made occasion to be in his company. She made sure that she was there as he came around the corner, and she would have begun to feed him the standard lines. Now, the striking thing about this is that Joseph— in his response to this woman, as we will see, was equally clear. But the lady is neither corrected by time, nor is she restrained by his refusals. Now, what does this tell you? It tells you something about the nature of allowing oneself to be held in the grip of vain and lustful imagination. It is the trap into which people fall concerning pornographic literature. It is the same ensnarement, because they allow themselves to be sucked down into the vortex, and they live then in that slimy pit. And every occasion becomes an occasion for the fulfillment of that, at least in their imaginings, and time won't fix it, and the strident concerns of others can't cure it, and we become enslaved. She was. She clearly was. And her approach, fourthly, was strategic. Verse 11, one day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. Bingo. Perfect opportunity. Did she create it? There's no one to say. We don't want to make her worse than she actually is. But she sure would have been glad of the opportunity, because after all, she knew his concerns and his scruples, and she perhaps figured to herself, as long as nobody sees, maybe I can get him, you know, as long as no one sees. Isn't it interesting when we sin that we think as long as, you know, our friends don't see, or our parents don't see, or our brother doesn't see, or whoever it is doesn't see, that we're okay? That's not the issue. God sees. God sees. And if the man's concern was only uh, whether anyone would know, if he could be suckered on account of that, if secrecy was enough to spill for him his convictions, then in this strategic approach, she would have him. But she was to discover that he couldn't, that he wouldn't. And she comes and she grabs him. She caught him by his cloak. And she surely didn't just sort of grab him, you know, like, like a, a butcher grabbing a, a hunk of ham. She didn't go, hey, Joe, hey, how you doing? <laughs> uh -uh, uh -uh. The subtleties of a seductress are far more keenly honed than that. She came at him in the way that was most de desirable, and she laid hold of him in the way that was absolutely compelling. And if he had managed to this point to stay at arm's length from the woman, he no longer was now. Now he's within the orb of her perfume. Now he can see her exactly as she is. And she has gone down the road from her eyes to her feet to her hands. Just in case we never get to it, put it away in the back of your mind what Jesus said about your eyes and your feet and your hands. If your eye offends you, what did he say to do? Pluck it out. If your hand offends you, chop it off. If your feet offend you, remove them. And failure to, to address the issue in this way leads such an individual further down the path. Okay, so we're noticing the particular elements in this strong temptation. The approach was subtle, the approach was striking, the approach was sustained, and the approach was strategic. Now notice, thirdly, the powerful example of Joseph's resistance. And this time, I have five subpoints. What about Joseph's resistance? Well, number one, it was decisive. Three words with which verse 8 begins, but he refused. 
She was very clear about our reproach. He was very clear about his response. And we're going to have to be, if we are ever going to be this decisive in dealing with temptation. We'll have to wait until heaven to find out how accurate this assertion is, but I do firmly believe that Joseph had already settled the issue in his mind. There was a measure of premeditation on Joseph's part. He had said to himself, now look, I'm in, I'm in Egypt. I'm a long way from my home. I don't have my father calling me. I don't have my mother to go home to. I have none of my brothers and sisters around. So what is it going to be like here? What's the challenge? What will the challenges be? And archaeological evidence shows us that Egyptian women were a byword for lewdness and for immorality. The pharaohs had a tremendous time finding a woman who had not been in the custody of four or five other men. And indeed, there's a classic story in the records of a man who tried to find a woman who had been faithful to her husband. And once he found the woman who had been faithful to her husband, he took her from, his, from her husband and he, and he made her his wife, the wife of the king. Because she was the only one that he could find in his kingdom who wasn't absolutely out of control. So Joseph, now he's in Egypt. For another guy, it's like, hey, spring break. Spring break forever. Fort Lauderdale everywhere. The whole package rolled into one. He looks back, says, you know, I was in the pit, but... Whew, I'm not in the pit anymore. This is all right here. And you know what? Since I've been doing those weights and everything, I, I can see the way they're looking at me. But no, 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 no. He must have in his mind settled the matter. Now, if this ever comes my way, what am I going to say? And the answer is, I'm going to say no. Now, let me tell you something about temptation. That is the only way to deal with temptation. As it is in our minds that we sow the seeds for our demise, so it is that by guarding our minds, we sow the seeds and plant, if you like, the fruit of our ability to say no. You cannot make it in the heat of the moment. The only way to, to deal with it is to plan for it in the cold light of dawn. And Joseph was absolutely decisive in his refusal. Secondly, he was principled in his response. Verse 8 and 9. He says, I'm in charge of everything. My master doesn't deal with anything in the house anymore. The only thing he cares about is his food, and he's kept nothing back from me except you because you are his wife. In other words, he says there is a rightness about that, and I understand it. Now, before we go on to his ace in the hole, notice this that a lesser individual, someone other than Joseph, might have employed the same circumstances as an occasion for sinning. In other words, the same circumstances present themselves to another person. And he looks at it and he says, here's the deal. I'm in charge. My master doesn't concern himself with anything in the house. So far, so good. He's entrusted everything to my care. Beautiful. He holds nothing back from me except you. We'll come to that in a moment. So, this is about as perfect as it gets. The circumstances are just moving me in that direction, the individual says. No, circumstances are neutral. Ultimately, it is our response to the circumstances. And what he does is he introduces principle. This, he says, would not be right. You are his wife, and you must fulfill the obligations of being a wife— I am a single man, and I must never intrude upon the privileges of your marriage. And notice how unashamed he is in introducing the matter of right and wrong. Verse 9. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? That was the kicker for him. In other words, and notice this carefully, there is no more powerful force in overcoming temptation than the fear of God. Than the fear of God. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. 
And the filial fear of God of which the Reformers and the Puritans wrote was absolutely clear. Not that I am afraid what you will do to me, but I am more afraid of what I, by my actions, will do to you. That's the kind of fear we want to instill in our children in relationship to their moms and dads. Not the fear of our eternal punishment, but the fear of the implications and bringing down of their family name in response uh, to the concerns of parental jurisdiction. And Joseph feared God. We are breeding a generation which, even in the context of church, negates the notion of fearing God. I'm growing old and gray listening to people from pulpits explain that we don't believe in the fear of God anymore. Oh, we're tired of sermons about the fear of God. Oh, we don't like to think of God in that way. Oh, let us be nice, you know. Oh, let us be comfortable. Oh, let us be endearing. Yes, fine, let's go ahead. And adultery and immorality is absolutely rampant in and out of the church for we're letting go of the very foundational principle which stands against it, the fear of God. And when that is instilled in the life of a boy, it'll make a difference no matter how deep he's buried in Egypt. But until it is, you can't even trust the kid next door to you. And somehow or another, Joseph had that fashioned into his life. And it made a difference he didn't come to the lady and say, you know, I don't want to do this. I'd be hurting you. I don't want to do this. I think it might get out. No, no. He says, I'm not going to do this. How could I do this? Such a wicked thing. And sin against God. Now, he's not addressing the issue of his desires. You know, if you could get Joseph on his own and say to him, you know, was she cute? He's going to say, cute? <sighs> Goodness gracious! I mean, yeah, she's the Potiphar's wife. But the response, the issue is, what are you going to do now, Joseph? I couldn't do this, he said. Listen, sexual sin, no matter what contemporary culture says, sexual sin is not just between two consenting adults. Sexual sin is an act of disobedience against God. And that's why you don't engage in sexual sin. That's why. No other reason. Not the pragmatism of it. Not the, what it might do to the children. Not what it might get around the office. Not it might be an issue here or there. No. It is a wicked thing. It is against God. Therefore, we don't do it. Even if we feel like it, we don't do it. Even if every circumstance moves in that direction, we don't do it. challenging message titled Joseph's Temptation from Alistair Begg and Truth for Life. Today's message is part of our series called The Hand of God. And if you've missed any portion of this series, or if you'd like to share Alistair's teaching with a friend, be sure to visit the online sermon archive. You'll find today's study, along with all of the previous messages in this series, at truthforlife.org. It's our pleasure to make this daily program available on the radio, online, on our Truth For Life app, all of it free of charge. But the only way we can do that is because of the faithful, generous partnership that comes from listeners like you. As you hear the teaching today, you're benefiting from the generosity of another listener, someone whose giving helped cover the cost of distributing today's program. When you join with us by giving a donation today, we want to send you an encouraging book titled God's Grace in Your Suffering. Author David Pollison weaves together scripture and personal stories to help us understand God's good purpose in our pain. Like Joseph, we can't always see how our current suffering will work for good. We can even be tempted to despair, feeling as if God has abandoned us. But even in our darkest times, we can cling to the truth that God is with us, that he is in control. Tomorrow is the last day that this book will be available, so be sure to get in touch soon. Ask for your copy of God's Grace in Your Suffering when you donate today by calling 888-588-7884 or request the book when you give online at truthforlife.org. I'm Bob Lapine. Tomorrow, Alistair continues drawing wisdom from Joseph's encounter with Potiphar's wife. We're learning how to stand strong in the face of temptation. Be sure to listen Wednesday. 
The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. the learning is for living.